Welcome to another edition of the Media Twits. I'm Mark Glazer, Executive Editor of PBS Media Shift. This week we'll be talking about crowdfunding the media and all this week on PBS Media Shift we'll be doing a special all about crowdfunding. Today we'll be talking about crowdfunding in media projects from news um, to documentaries and talk about all the different platforms that are that are allowing people to crowdfund and even people who are crowdfunding with their own platforms and now crowdfinancing where people can put money into startups and take a stake and invest in those companies. We'll talk about those new rules as well. Before we get started in our discussion, I want to introduce our roundtable of participants. We have Andrew Lee from American University joining us. We have Claire Grodin, our Media Twits intern. We have Ernst Jan Kraut from Amsterdam and Dick Correspondent joining us. We have Slava Rubin, CEO of Indiegogo, one of the first, if not the first, uh, crowdfunding platforms. We have Zach Piper, uh, producer of Life Itself, the um, Roger Ebert documentary coming out uh, within the next few months, hopefully, if they hit their goals. Um, so let's talk about crowdfunding. Um, it has uh, an interesting history that Andrew can tell us a little bit more about, but um, really over the last few years due to technology, it's been a way to raise money um, and kind of get around the typical funding model of you know getting investors or um, with journalism or media it can be advertising or getting people to pay but really it's kind of a different a different way of bringing in your fans and participants and making them a part of the process um, Ernst why don't you start and tell us a little bit about the correspondent um, you're in Holland you're in Amsterdam and you raised 1.7 million dollars using your own crowdfunding platform which is incredibly impressive and I guess Jay Rosen has called it the most interesting journalism startup he's read about in 2013, and he's working on the Omidyar project, so that's <laughs> really big praise from him. Tell, tell us more about what you guys are doing that's so special and how you raised $1.7 million. Okay, well, we started uh, early this year uh, together with my colleague uh, uh, Rob. He is the editor-in-chief, and I'm the publisher, and we both worked at a pretty big newspaper. You could say the New York Times of the Netherlands. It's a quality newspaper. And uh, it's well, we worked there. He was editor in chief of the morning edition. I was uh, editor in chief of the uh, digital edition. And um, uh, we were both not really satisfied with our work there. He wanted Rob wanted to focus more on uh, the the analysis on the backgrounds, and uh, I wanted to experiment more with digital uh, means. So we figured, why not start uh, our our own publication, our own newspaper. But of course, we need investors, and that's really hard now finding the right investors. And we saw at our own newspaper where we work that having private equity in your company uh, is not a really good way to face the future because most of the most of the profits go to the shareholders. So we thought we need uh, people to actually finance this, uh, normal people. And uh, we came up with a with a name together with an agency, uh, uh, and the name was the Correspondent. And we asked all the journalists we admired, and some of them were pretty famous in the Netherlands, so they were well-established uh, journalists uh, to join us. And then we went on national television. We were lucky to be invited to um, uh, this, this show called The World Keeps On Turning. And uh, one million people watch that show every day, and there are 16 million people living in the Netherlands. So it's a huge show. And uh, we were allowed to talk about our project. And within one day, we had 5,000 people who invested $80 uh, for a, a one-year subscription. And from that moment on, it just, it just, well, just skyrocketed, and people joined us. And in uh, in eight days, we had our goal of fifteen thousand people who paid eighty dollars, and uh, well, it kept them growing until twenty thousand. And uh, that's that's impressive. How did you get on that show? Well, all, all almost all of the journalists who joined us were already famous in the Netherlands, so it was this big thing that they started their own newspaper. So. On that show, for example, Rob, the editor in chief, was accompanied by uh, uh, the uh, former leader of the Green Party, who now turned uh, into a journalist. So that that was really a big name. And also, uh, the Louis Theroux of the Netherlands also joined us. His name is Jelle. So it was really easy to get invited because they were like 
wow, these, these really uh, well-known journalists are starting their own gig. And that, that, that feeling, that, that revolution, revolutionary feeling that really uh, hit us, well, hit a nerve, I guess. And you're not taking any advertising. You're just a completely paid-for publication that's only read, only going to be able to, only people who are subscribers and paid subscribers will be able to read the, the stories? Yeah, we, we basically took everything from the newspaper we worked that we didn't like and we dumped it. And one of those things was advertisers because we noticed that a lot of people um, at the newspaper had to write travel stories because they sell really well because the advertisers can put their travel ads next to it or career stories as well. And we figured, let's get rid of advertising. We don't have to build this whole sales department. And we can just focus on making a great, great newspaper for the one shareholder we have, our reader. And Till now, that works really well because, well, we're totally independent and and uh, and we don't have to find any advertise. We could just focus on keeping our readers satisfied, and that's that's a great feeling. And you also do this thing where the the writers kind of have their own, I guess, garden or their own kind of fan page or something. So they cover their topic, and they're really kind of the guide on that topic, right? Yeah, the idea is that you don't have to be a slave of current affairs. If you're a journalist, you can just focus on the things you find important. So if you're a correspondent and you're writing about, uh, let's say, the continent of Africa and Mandela dies, just because he dies is for your reason to write about it. Whereas every other Afri African correspondent is writing about it. You read the same stories everywhere. And we, for example, run a story on uh, the uh, startup, uh, startup uh, scene in Kenya. And because we think that's equally, if not more important uh, uh, to us because there are so many newspapers already writing about the current affairs uh, that are mainstream, and we like to focus on the developments that are not that newsy, but probably more important to our lives. And uh, to make that happen, every journalist has uh, his or her own garden where he can post updates and keep people updated on what he or she is writing about, and at some point he writes a story, the big story, and it goes to all our readers. But to get all the small updates, you really have to follow that correspondent. Yeah, it does. Well, it sounds like a little utopian, actually. Uh, you know, we hope that that works out for you guys. And you, why, why did you decide to kind of do your own crowdfunding platform? Yeah, well, well, well first about the utopian part, if you don't mind. We have, we have 25,000 subscribers now. If, if we would be an American publication, that would be 450,000 subscribers. So we really see that people feel a need for this, and, and they, well, we every day we get 50 new members, which is pretty much in, in, in the Netherlands. And we built our own platform because um, we wanted to have absolute control of how the website looked and, and to really get our, our, our message abroad. And it wasn't that hard, really, to build our own platform because we partnered up with an agency, their co-founder, and they, well, they built the platform in, I guess, two months, and it allowed us to really, to really control everything in, in the design and in how we uh, communicate to our, to our future readers. Andrew, did you want to jump in with a question for Ernst? Yeah, it's, it's really impressive what you've been doing with that. And I think in the GigaOM piece I read about this, they're trying to relate to Americans what this meant. It's kind of like the, the heads of the New York Times going on to Oprah to market a brand new startup. And that's why you folks got you know so much interest in it. I'm wondering whether there's a tradition in the Netherlands of public funding of media, right? So in fact, mm -hmm. the... the uh, the tradition goes back quite far. Do you think that played well into the interest that you folks got for funding your site? Well, uh, I guess the Dutch people are really used to subscribing to to uh, newspapers. So uh, our our Dutch newspapers have huge subscriber numbers. So that that really helps. We're, it, newspapers here are less dependent on advertising. I guess it's. Uh, it's not even 50-50, so I guess uh, I'm not, not sure, but 70% of the re revenue of a newspaper comes from subscribing. So that, that really helped in getting people to, to pay because we're really used to subscribing to, to newspapers. And about the public funding, um, there's this, there's this um, public broadcasting, which is huge in the Netherlands, that's, that's publicly funded. But other newspapers are, are, most of them are privately funded, so they're owned by big corporations as well. And Slava, I'm curious, just in your point of view from Indiegogo, um, what are the prospects? I mean, there's been a lot of publications 
um, and journalism projects that have been on Indiegogo. What what do you think? How have you seen that change over the years? I mean, it's great to uh, see since January 2008 launch. Just the uh, campaigns continue to get bigger and better. Right now we have a uh, campaign with the Young Turks, and they're able to build out their studio after uh, stepping out from Current TV's offices, and I think they're at over three hundred thousand dollars U.S. Uh, with this being their final day. I think that uh, it's really a going on where access to capital is really an issue across different countries. Just this Tuesday was uh, Giving Tuesday in America, and uh, actually we had people from sep from 92 countries fund camps in 78 countries, right? So in one day, that's how much uh, funding was going across the world. I think it's a really exciting, great um, media example was really the um, the advertising that was requested to be done in the New York Times, which is when there was the revolution going on in Turkey a few months ago. It happened on a weekend, and on Monday, three global citizens decided to try to raise money to be able to get the word out about what was going on in Turkey, and they wanted to raise $52,000 to get a full page ad in the New York Times. By Tuesday, they were fully funded and had actually over $100,000. Wednesday and Thursday, they were able to finalize everything with the New York Times and actually get the crowd to confirm what should be in the content at the advertisement. On Friday, the ad ran in the New York Times in the paper, and then the following week, the world really covered it as a media story, which was really beneficial to the folks that are trying to raise their voices up in Turkey. I think it's exciting times. I mean, do you think that... Um that these kind of activist campaigns seem to take hold a little bit more than, let's say, someone saying, hey, I'm going to start a new publication, please fund it, um, you know, or I've got this existing publication, please save it. Um, what, you know, what have you seen as far as kind of the more activist campaigns or causes versus someone just kind of trying to start some sort of publication? Yeah, no, I mean, yes, looking to write a story, start a magazine, or start a book, or a bookstore, or something of that sort has been happening quite a bit as well. Um, there's even a book right now in the vein of Hunger Games called uh, Hayline, I believe is how you say it, H-A-L-I-N-E, and they're looking to write a, a book, and uh, they're getting fully funded and going well beyond that. Or there was a bookstore in uh, New York City, which was really serving the Latin American market, and they were able to raise the $40,000 they needed in 40 days to really be able to serve that uh, audience. So I think it really runs the gamut. It's really up to the audience to decide uh, what matters to them and try to eliminate the gatekeepers from making that decision. So, Zach, uh, I, I'm curious to hear about, you, you know, you guys have a full-on production doing the, the documentary about Roger Ebert's life life itself. You got through a lot of the production of the documentary, mm -hmm. and then you went kind of to the crowd to fundraise and post-production. What, what was your thinking in doing that? Well, we'd, we'd actually planned on using crowdfunding for the duration of the project. It was just a matter of timing and, uh, you know, making sure we had the preparation in place. But, I mean, the, the real idea behind it is really about building community and kind of an extension of what Roger was all about as a film critic and, you know, democratizing film criticism in, you know, many ways that's what, um, you know, crowdfunding is, um, a democratization of, of funding. And um, so we, we really felt that that was going to be an important part here. And, and it's really allowed us to connect directly to uh, Roger Ebert fans and, and um, film fans to sort of foster that that community. The other thing that, um, the, the other important point that it allows us to do, we raise most of the, the production budget ourselves outside of crowdfunding, but this, uh, this funding goal um, will allow us to retain rights and control then how the film is released. Whereas in other, you know, previous films, for instance, the, the Interrupters, we had to sell off certain rights just to finish the film, which then, um, you know, we were we didn't have full control to release that film. This film, we feel it's very important that we want to have a theatrical release. We want to control how it gets out uh, into the world, and crowdfunding will be a part of the reason that we are able to do that. 
So you were able to kind of keep more rights to the film by doing crowdfunding, and it sounds like it's a it's a big marketing thing too. If you, you know, you're selling a lot of your perks are you know going to premieres and you know mm -hmm. getting a getting a preview of the movie. So I'm guessing right. that will the fans will kind of share that with people. It'll really help in marketing too. Yeah, uh, perhaps. I mean, I, I think that you, that's the sort of the core of our campaign, which is the twenty five dollar perk of um, the the pre theatrical streaming of the film. So anyone who pays for that, they get to see the film before it's actually released into the world. What What do you think is kind of you know as a producer, are you seeing this as a is this becoming more common in bigger productions? I know you know Indiegogo. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of thought about independence and how they needed they needed help, but now it seems like even larger productions are going to crowdfunding too. Yeah, I mean, you you do see that, and I think it just speaks to the difficulty, even for you know uh, established filmmakers, to raise funds for the film. And I mean, we we really felt that in addition to the the fundraising, it was really more about, or as much about that as it was about being able to connect to you know the community of people who are interested in this project. Andrew, did you have any thoughts about just kind of documentaries and, and using crowdfunding? It seems like something that's been going on for a while and probably will continue to. Yeah, I'm wondering uh, whether Zach had any I, you know, views on some of the other uh, efforts to crowdfund um, video productions or documentary. I know Spike Lee tried something earlier this year that got a little bit of criticism um, yeah. as to whether it was fully formed or whether he was writing on the notoriety of his of his. Uh, Fame. Um, mm -hmm. Any ideas on, you know, how successful this has been so far? Well, I mean, I think, speaking generally, I think it's it is a you know people have found success, which is why people are you know like us are coming back, um, and you know, looking at crowdfunding as as a as a way to raise money for for uh, completing the film. I mean, I think one of the ways that was important to us to do this, um, not sort of knowing how you know, successful we would be with the campaign and, and really to kind of, um, um, you know, go at it in a way where we don't, we don't, um, let me say it a different way, where we go at it in a way where we bring in, um, you know, these uh, charitable components, which is a reason why we went with Indiegogo, because we're able to, once we reach our, our funding goal, any money we raise beyond that, it allows us to bring in, um, these two charities, uh, both associated with with Roger, um, the Roger and Chaz Ebert uh, Family Foundation, and then the Roger Ebert uh, Film Studies Center. It's a a new um, scholarship and program at the U of I, uh, Roger's alma mater. So we sort of had a you know certain people have like Spike Lee and others have asked for a lot of money and tried to raise a lot of money. We're we're raising you know a, a smaller percentage of our budget this way, and then committing. Um, funds beyond the goal to these charities, or a, a right. portion of them to the charities. Right, right. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the issues of the Spike Lee thing was, did he really need that 1.25 right. million? He could have right. put it out of his pocket, but right. as Mark mentioned before, there's a marketing and, and interesting angle there. I mean, one of the cool things, thinking about this topic before we came on, was the fact that crowdsourcing um, actually has a very old history with newspapers, so one of the strange stories about the Statue of Liberty is that uh, although France gave it to the U.S., there was no money to actually create the stone pedestal for where it was going to be. And Joseph Pulitzer, the publisher of the New York World, thought that it should be the American people who should fund this thing, even though he probably could have just written a check and paid for the whole thing. He used his newspaper to solicit donations from the public and promised that anyone who donated money to the pedestal, the Statue of Liberty, around 1880, would get their name printed in the paper. So, in fact, you had kids and folks from all walks of life send in money to fund the pedestal, and in the New York World paper, Pulitzer put in all these little names there. So this was kind of like the original Facebook wall or uh, RSS feed that allowed people to get their names in the paper. I think in the end, they said that 80% of the donations were of a dollar or less to fund that pedestal. So it really was kind of one of the original crowdsourcing experiments by a newspaper. And uh, the funny thing is it, it took a long time before newspapers thought of doing this again. 
and they didn't take advantage of that early um, experience in, in uh, getting the crowd involved with what they were doing. Yeah, and crowdfunding, you know, is is happening in a lot of other places too. I mean, you look at what happened with the Obama campaign and how many small donations he got too. Um, and now with the new rules um, coming from the SEC around this and from the Jobs Act around kind of financing, now there's a whole realm of investing that's happening in crowdfunding, almost what you call crowd financing. Um, is that something that you know? Where are you guys at, Slava, as far as? investing goes. I know there's a lot of sites out there now that are offering, you know, basically it's almost like going public right away online as a crowdfunding experiment. Is that something you'll look into as well? Um, yes, absolutely. I, I jump back to the previous topic for a second. Um, like with Zach, I mean, I think they're doing an incredible job with the uh, campaign and I think Zach really mentioned a couple of the uh, great things that they're doing and why crowdfunding and Indiegogo is a really interesting way of doing it. Number one, they wanted to control their distribution and really control their creative rights, which I think is an important element of how people are using the tool to be able to move forward in their process. And I think the other beautiful thing that Zach and his team are doing that hasn't really been noticed too much is unlike many other large campaigns that try to have massive contributions and look for big dollars, they've actually set a $25 perk, which is to be able to see the movie and get that digital distribution right. And it's a very kind of every man or every person kind of feel to the approach, which you're actually hurting yourself a little bit by setting a $25 level, because if you set it at a $100 level, you only had to get one fourth the amount of people. But here they need four times more people in comparison if they had $100. But I think it goes back to their, their vision and their point of view of making this really a democratization, which is really how to best use uh, the platform. So I just wanted to uh, really put that out there for a second. In terms of equity crowdfunding, I think it's really, really exciting. Uh, since 1933, when the Securities Act came out, which really changed the laws and required sophisticated investors and uh, um, IPOs and private placement memorandums, this is really a large change, the first change in over 80 years. I think there's going to be a lot of excitement, some education will be needed and there will be potential for some volatility. Um, there's four reasons why anybody funds anything in life. Number one is because they care about the passion or the person, uh, sorry, the person or the cause, we call that passion. Number two, they want the perks, they want the product or the service, um, so we call that perks. Number three, they want to participate, very much like the Statue of Liberty example. And number four, they want profit. They want to give one dollar and get five dollars back. Indiegogo has really been trying to service the first three immediately. We always wanted to do all four, but because of the laws, we had to wait. Little did we know, that within the next four years, the laws would be changing, and one of our campaigns would be on stage with President Obama in April of 2012. The answer to your question is yes, we are very interested, we are leaning forward, we are working with the SEC and the folks in DC, and we're trying to help figure this out. It's a balancing act for the SEC in terms of investor protections, and then also allowing for innovation to still happen. And a beautiful thing to note is since equity crowdfunding became part of the national agenda in the U.S. two years ago, Indiegogo has actually um, multiplied its transaction volume 10x in the last 10 years. So there's been a lot of demand for people uh, you know, funding their causes, funding their creative projects, and funding their businesses. Ernst, I'm curious, on your point of view, um, when people, you know, they, they basically, in your crowdfunding campaign, they bought subscriptions, would you be interested in having them kind of come on as almost like crowd investing in your, in your publication? Definitely. It was too complicated for us now to, to accomplish that, so we did promise that everyone who would invest during the crowdfunding stage would be, uh, would every year would be able to determine uh, um, the the costs for our profits. So, 95% uh, of our revenue goes goes back into uh, in, into the company. So there's only a 5% profit margin uh, for uh, for our uh, for our shareholders. So 95% they can decide for that 95% what 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 would happen with that. So every year we will we will organize this this online survey where uh, members can first send in their ideas and after that they can vote for 
which idea we should actually do. So it's it's a bit symbolic and it's it's a first step in the direction of of making our readers shareholders and and really allowing them to decide on what to do with our with our money. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see how that turns out. And um, we couldn't have, we were hoping to have Todd Ruppert on, um, who's producing a Happy Days musical in the UK, and I think they actually did, were taking people's money as investments in the production, um, so that, you know, depending on how the production did, people could, I believe, get money back for their investment. Um, Zach, is that something you ever, I mean, what do you think about that idea of doing a, you know, producing a movie, producing a play? Um, and actually, rather than just giving people perks, you're actually giving them a stake in an actual investment in the production. What do you think about that? I mean, I think it's a really interesting idea. I don't know how it would work, you know, uh, on the on the back end in terms. I mean, it would be a lot of work if you're talking about having, you know, a thousand, two thousand investors in your film, and you know, each with a small percentage of, you know, I guess the the net profits. Um, that could potentially be, you know, every quarter you're, you know, um, you know, sharing the profits. That could potentially be a full-time job. Um, but it, it's an interesting idea, and I, I don't really know enough about how other sites have that set up. But, um, you know, could be, it could add some complication. But maybe I, that's something that Slav is trying to solve mm -hmm. with his service. <laughs> Uh, y yes, I mean, the idea would be to try to come up with uh, scalable solutions, no question. Uh, to Zach's question, one of the things that has been proposed as part of the JOBS Act is even if all the individuals, let's call it 100 or 500 or 2,000 investors, they will probably be rolled up into a single entity. Um, so you actually would only have one investor, um, and it'd be up for the platforms or the other back-end solutions to manage this. Well, that's a much better, uh, a much better solution. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> now, what do you think about that, Andrew? I'm curious on the kind of the crowd investing thing. Um, I know there's a lot of controls in place to make sure that there's not scams, but this idea that you could literally put your startup or your project online, take investors, and I mean, literally just go public that way. I mean, you're you're selling shares to the public, really, and. And they have to be, you know, obviously vetted as investors that they're, you know, serious and they're gonna they're gonna do this, you know, under some sort of agreement. What do you think yeah. about it? I mean, it's interesting. It'd be interesting to find out what um, what Slava thinks about um, a lot of commentary about Indiegogo and Kickstarter right now is that people who fund these campaigns for twenty or twenty five dollars, um, because they are not shareholders or investments per se, but donations. Um, a lot of people say, you know, this is this is for entertainment purposes only. In fact, a lot of folks who donate the twenty twenty five dollars, even if that product never ever shows up in on their doorstep or in their mailbox, are not going to go after those folks or sue them or anything. It is uh, it's kind of interesting that dynamic. But what happens when you then do turn to the model where you're obligated um, or that's equity in that uh, in that company or that enterprise? Does that change the dynamic here and? And are there there more serious things that these uh, sites like Indiegogo or Kickstarter have to step up to, and and maybe you'll have a different type of person who participates in something where you're on the hook for equity investment. I mean, it goes back to the point I brought up about the four reasons why anybody funds in life. Uh, we mentioned there was passion, which is donation, perks, which are the products and experiences, participation, and then also profit. You know, I would uh, ask Zach. Uh, do, does he think that his funders would be okay if they never delivered a movie? And the short answer is probably going to be no, they would not be happy. And legally, from a terms of service perspective, actually, there has been lawsuits that have happened on other platforms. Uh, we're proud of the fact that there have not been uh, lawsuits on Indiegogo. But I, uh, I actually have to say that I don't agree with the fact that what's on Indiegogo today is quote-unquote for entertainment purposes only. People have different reasons why they fund things and people have different reasons about what they care about. And some people will only care about profit and that is perfectly fine. And uh, the bar will have to stay just as high around fraud and trust and transparency as it is today with Indiegogo. So I think it will be really important to maintain that education, transparency and trust when we come out with equity crowdfunding as well. 
Are you going to have a different brand for that? Do you imagine there's going to be like Indiegogo, a different type of brand, or Indiegogo Labs for the ones that's more speculative, or what do you think? It's hard to answer that right now. I mean, we are doing a lot of research and we're working with the various constituents, whether it be people that want to raise money on Indiegogo for equity, we've already had a lot of demand, uh, or with talking with the folks at the SEC or other regulators. The reason it's hard to answer yet is until you know what the final rules are, it's hard to know exactly uh, the environment you're playing within. But I feel that uh, come the time that it does roll out, which will hopefully be in 2014, it's going to be an exciting first few years, and it will take time to evolve. And I bet, you know, 10 years from now, we won't even be talking about it anymore. It'll just be so layered into the everyday fabric about how funding gets done. We'll say, do you remember when? <laughs> So Ernst, I'm curious from your point of view, you have all these subscribers, they put in the money for your publication, um, you know, do you feel, what's it like to feel like, you know, you're, you're really answering to that group of people, um, you're kind of held accountable to your readers probably in a bigger way than a lot of other publications are. Right, yeah, because last week we had our first like, really big scoop and then uh, most of the comments on that story were, were like, this is what I paid for, this is why I invested, this is what I wanted from the correspondent. So you really see that people, people have expectations and every now and then we we have a certain story that fulfills that ex expectation and they celebrate that. At the same time, we had, as I mentioned, we had 20,000 people who invested during the crowdfunding. Uh, 1,200 of them have never logged in. So they just, inv they just invested and, and figured, well, we're glad that the correspondent is here, but it's just for one year. So for us, it's really, really exciting and also a bit scary to see what will happen on September 2014 when uh, all our readers had their year-long subscription and then we'll have to renew their subscription, their crowdfunding subscription into a normal one. And we're really eager to see how many people will renew their subscription and will stay with us because they once invested in an idea and now we're an actual publication and it might, they might not like how it turned out. So it's it's really an exciting time for us uh, after uh, after coming summer. Yeah, and we've had Andrew Sullivan on our show talking about how he went independent and really, you know, picked up subscriptions and just his struggles. And you know, even though he's had raised a lot of money, that's the question. You know, can you you still? It's a it's a you're constantly going to have to go back to them and ask for money, right? Yeah, because because uh, yeah, we because we asked for one year sixty sixty euros eighty dollars. And after that, we will just have to wait and see whether they, they still think that we need the money. Because at first, we were just a, a bunch of journalists who needed the money to actually start it up. But now we're a, a real publication. So maybe they feel like, well, you, can, you guys can manage on your own now. So it's, it's going to be, a, that's, that's, a, that's our big question. Definitely. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate everyone coming on to talk about um, crowdfunding and success stories and what's going to happen with crowdfinancing. It's something, you know, we'll be watching on our podcast definitely for, you know, probably years to come, like you said, Slava. Um, we want to thank uh, our panel, Andrew Lee from American University, Claire Grodin, MediaTwits uh, and MediaShift intern, Ernst John Kraut from De Correspondent, in Amsterdam where he's drinking wine since it is evening there. We will let him have it, <laughs> enjoy his glass of wine. Slava, Ruben from the Indiegogo platform and Zach Piper, Life Itself producer. Um, we're going to be taking off for the holidays the rest of the year but we will catch you next year um, with the new um, revamped Media Twits podcast. So, hope you all have a great holidays and uh, enjoy.